Welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition today, also joining us on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the Village of Franklin is Birmingham Area Municipal Access. And also joining us on the radio in the Bloomfield Hills area is 88.1 WBFH, the BIF, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. Today, as always, we are on the web as well, civiccentertv.com. Click on our Watch Live link or watching the small player on our homepage and join us on the Facebook page today of the West Bloomfield Township Clerk's Office. A big thank you to Debbie Binder and her entire team for joining us on the Thursday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. And as always, as we bring you the most important news stories from around the greater West Bloomfield, Oakland County, and state of Michigan area. Joining me in the studio today is Ronnie Dahl. I'm tired today. Yeah, I'm a little tired too. It's, a little, it's been a long week already. I know, crazy. but uh, it is Thursday. But do you ever have those uh, mornings where it just doesn't matter? You cannot yeah. seem to wake up? Yeah, th this has uh, definitely been one of those days. It's one of those, those days where I, I, I woke up and I was fine, but... But then I got gradually more tired, and all of a sudden it was like 8 o'clock, and I'm getting ready to go. And I can't believe it's already 8 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. It does feel like this week's gone by quickly, but it also feels like this has been the longest week ever. It's one of those weird weeks where it's flying by, but at what cost? But there is reason to celebrate. Yes, there is. This morning, I got an email. The Gaelic League of Detroit is reopening. Really? Just in time for St. Patrick's Day. Because really, let's think about it. Other than St. Patty's Day, March is kind of an eh month. It is. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's one of the more boring months of the year. Of yeah, course. I mean, it's you March. know, everything is brown and gray and ugly as the snow yeah. melts. And then you could start to see all the trash and... You know, that's been under the snow. So other than St. Patrick's Day, right? Oh, what's March good for? No, there's nothing. Oh, good. oh, oh, oh spring starting? Cool. Every other month of spring is better. So you know what, March? You're underwhelming. But St. Patrick's <laughs> Day is fun. And especially last year, you just had joined. I remember you telling the story yesterday. You just joined the Gaelic League right before St. Patrick's Day. You're looking forward to that being your first hurrah with the Gaelic League. And then COVID hit, and it shut it down. And you were down in Corktown to celebrate anyway. But it was you and one other person, right? So... You know, underwhelming start, and now you're back, rising again like, like the Gaelic Phoenix, back to have some fun on St. Patrick's Day, as you said, and as I agree, the only interesting day in the, in the month of March. I need to uh, renew my membership. It is, uh, it is so inexpensive. I mean, it's like, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, something like that for the year. So the way the Gaelic League does work is, is members only. Mm -hmm. Anyone can go in, but to actually purchase the drinks, it needs to be a member, and you need your uh, card to be able to purchase the drinks. Um, but uh, they are going to be reopened at the because of the 50% capacity is why they've decided to go ahead and reopen uh, starting on Friday. So they'll be allowed uh, up to 88 members will be allowed in the Gaelic League nice. of Detroit. But uh, that place has been around for eons. Mm -hmm. Eons. It's a big supporter of local first responders. So many um, police officers and firefighters, that's always the place to go when they have the retirement parties. Oh, okay. So is that just a St. Patrick's no. Day thing? No, of course not. Uh, but with that, a little cold out there today, though. Yeah, a little chillier than it's been, but you know, still kind of nice. N nice sunshine. I'll take the sunshine and a little bit of chilliness early on in the month of May. That's to be expected. It's a lot better than being chilly, cold, gray, gloomy, and cloudy outside. I'll take that any day. And the snow's starting to melt. I'm seeing grass again. Even though it's dead grass, it's lifting my spirits. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, when I came in this morning, there were snow flurries. Yeah, it was, it was very light snow, though. It's just like it's, it's, it's dropping here and there. It's not really sticking to the ground. It's melting on your windshield. That's fine. Okay, get the rest of it out, Mother Nature. We're done with, we're done with your winter. Uh, so, Tyler, uh, let me ask you this. Have you ever done this? Um, sometimes when it comes to the end of the the season and spring is happening but you still have those little piles of snow in your yard like maybe you know that's where you shoveled and so the piles were higher there and they haven't melted yet i will take hot water 
and pour on them just to melt them so that I have no snow left in my yard. I have not done that before, nor have I heard of anybody that has done that before <laughs> before you, but that is an interesting strategy <clears throat> that's here. This is what I think of your precious little winter. It's over. You're done. I see the sun. It's been over 50. We're done with winter. Get out of here. See you next year. I right. like it. I like it. You know, take control. Great strategy. Take control. Anyone out there, feel free to use my method to say goodbye to winter once and for all. Hey, uh, so some good news. Michigan is going to be opening the vaccine to people over the age of 50. That was the big announcement uh, yesterday. The state of Michigan is preparing to open COVID-19 vaccine availability to people older than 50 years old with health risk, such as pre-existing conditions or disabilities. So people over the age of 50, regardless of health condition, will be eligible to begin receiving the vaccine starting March 22nd. The others will be able to uh, be eligible eligible with those pre-existing health conditions starting uh, next Monday. The state is also going to be opening eligibility starting Monday, Monday to caregiver families and guardians caring for children with special needs. State Health Department is making the move because the state will have a historic number of vaccine doses available in the next couple of weeks. Now, some people are saying we are still having issues getting other individuals vaccinated. Um, some of our seniors are having a hard time securing some of these vaccinations. Uh, Mark Hackle, who is the you know county executive for Macomb County, mm -hmm. has come out against this plan. His county is having a hard time getting enough vaccines, and he's saying, "Why are you going to clog the system even more when we're still trying to get those our seniors uh, vaccinated?" And kind of a good point there. Yeah, it, it's a valid question. I mean, certainly it's great news to have a record number of vaccines. Available. Available. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine being approved recently has definitely been a catalyst for the vaccine process, not only in Michigan, but throughout the U.S. But with that, I can also see, I also see great merit in the point that Mark Hackle is making where we've been so behind getting to these key groups, seniors, those that have comorbidities, those that are in, uh, those that are in situations that may make them more susceptible to severe cases of COVID really need this vaccine first and we should still be going in that order before we start opening up to more general parts of the population. That being said, if there is availability to do both at the same time, then it's advantageous and from a public health standpoint, it's prudent to do so. Well, they are now saying that there is a possibility that um, the vaccine will be available to everyone who mm -hmm. wants it uh, by uh, May or June. Yes. So first they were saying, you know, it could be next uh, fall, and then that got pushed to July, and now they're saying possibly even May or June. Yeah, also good news, and again, it just uh, goes to show how much of a catalyst this third vaccine has been, being able to have more options out there to provide to the, to the public. Um, certainly, there's been a lot more of a public information campaign lately to inform people of of each of these vaccines and their efficacy and how they were tested and why they should and how they can sign up to get vaccines in different areas other than just their local county or municipal government and get on those lists and get through the process. So things look like they're speeding up. We'll see how that goes and how the government responds to this momentum that they have right now and hopefully speed this process up and get it back on track. Dozens of Oakland County businesses, Tyler, have joined the over 2,000 businesses statewide that have participated in the Michigan Occupational Safety and Health Administration COVID-19 Workplace Safety Ambassador Program. Program is a partnership between MIOSHA and NSF International, which provides staff to serve as workplace safety ambassadors who visit and work with Michigan business owners to help them better implement the COVID-19 workplace safety measures as well as best practices. Program, uh, if you remember, was launched this past September. So to date, the program has been primarily focused on retail stores, restaurants, and fitness centers. But recently, Myosha announced it is going to begin offering the ambassador visits to child care centers across the state as well. So a lot of companies are taking advantage of that ambassador program. Again, this is one way uh, to help them avoid getting any fines for not following the work workplace safety procedures. They are hiring individuals to go around and um, kind of be more of an educational ambassador 
uh, if you will, to some of these businesses. Yeah, it's part of that frontline enforcement that's always been kind of questionable during this pandemic because you can only really oversee so many businesses at, at one time and make sure that so many are compi complying at one time. So having these ambassadors be out there to measure that compliance, to help the state, and in particular, Myosha, keep these businesses in COVID safety guideline compliance and better yet, educate these businesses to put better practices in place has been clearly very helpful. And with 90% of those businesses being complying with face, facial covering, cleaning, and disinfection, as, it, as has marked in this article. It's showing that they are capable of taking the rules that are put in place, implementing them, and maintaining a safe environment, whether it is within those rules or more severe rules that they in, implement themselves. All the more reason why that has been something that has been preached by many organizations, whether it be Chambers of Commerce, the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association, and so on, as they've been urging the state government to relax to be even further relaxed with their COVID-19 guidelines while still emphasizing the safety of the public health. Uh, well, I, um, you know, for some people, um, it's hard to keep up with these changes. Yes. They change so often that unless you're on the government's website every day and trying to keep up with them, it can be very confusing out there. Should we do this? Should we not do this? Or is that still mandated or is it recommended? It can get confusing, so that's good that uh, they have these ambassadors that are helping with that. Yeah. Hey, um, yesterday, Michigan's Republican-led legislature finalized its long-awaited COVID-19 plan on Wednesday, authorizing the state to spend $3.45 billion, with a B, out of roughly $5 billion in federal funding sent here in December by Congress and the uh, former president. Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, though, wanted a $5.6 billion dollar plan and is likely to veto some of the proposed funding because it's tied to separate bills that would force her to give up some of her authority to respond to the pandemic. They are saying, hey, uh, it, some of these decisions should be left up to your local health department or your county health departments. The plan, which includes state funding, and totals $4.25 billion passed with bipartisan support and clears the way for increase in uh, education funding, vaccine distribution, temporary business tax breaks, unemployment assistance, and help for renters and those behind on their property tax. But uh, all eyes will be on Lansing as the two sides try to work this out. Yeah, they're going to continue to have their battles over over this, and of course, the, it's 1.4 billion dollars lower than what the governor was hoping to be using out of this federal funding. Maybe that's because uh, the state, the Republican Republican state legislature, just wants to save some more of that money to be distributed later on, should it be needed, or maybe it's just because they believe that that these programs didn't need to have as much of this federal money invested into it. Whatever the case may be, the governor's definitely going to, re to veto anything that's going to reduce her ability from the executive office to manage the response to this pandemic. And that's, of course, going to continue to be a sticking point with the state legislature. As these two sides continue to bicker and refuse to find any sort of common ground when it comes to the state response, even a year into this, when they've had more than enough time to do so and have just clearly shown they have no desire to work with one another. Uh, the Bridge uh, magazine, um, it, they they were the ones that originally did this article. So if you get yes. a chance, uh, read the entire article because they really do a good job of breaking down uh, the noise between the two sides and kind of saying, okay, what did this individual say? What about the Republicans? What about the Democrats? You know, and some of the claims that yes. our elected leaders are making <clears throat> they dig deep into some of those claims and uh, clarify what is true and what is false. So if you get a chance, check out that article. It's on civiccentertv.com. Click on coronavirus, but then if you uh, click the top tab, that will take you directly to the bridge article as well. You have all those articles on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, as well as links to, to helpful websites in the local area and at the state and federal level, direct information from reputable sources about COVID-19 and other public health matters in the Oakland County area. Uh, so along with that as well, you may want to um, go ahead and bookmark civiccentertv.com because at the top of that page, uh, like you were saying, you have the direct links to the CDC. 
as well as um, the state of Michigan, so you can try to keep up with all of the changes um, each and every day, but also along with that, Oakland County is a good one that I check every day as well, uh, Tyler. Yeah, a lot of good information there and the opportunity to sign up to save your spot in line for COVID-19 vaccines. If you click on our Oakland County link on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, if you go to the Oakland County's website and click on vaccine, all that information you need on the COVID-19 vaccines and your ability to save your spot or remove your spot after you have been vaccinated is all on that page and you have direct links to those pages from civiccentertv.com. Uh, with that, we're going to take a quick break here on the show, but we have an interesting day ahead of us. Uh, Tyler will be speaking um, with the Senior Director uh, for the Diversity and Inclusion and uh, Consumer Events for MRA uh, Marketing Company. I believe they are out of... Uh Auburn Hills, maybe? Yes, I believe so. Uh, Kurt Lawson will be with us here as well. He, of course, is the deputy chief over at the West Bloomfield Police Department. We'll be talking to him about some of the fraud that is going on. Also, we'll be speaking with uh, Birmingham and Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce in the 11 o'clock hour, along with our good friends over at the Blue Skies Brewery. And Dr. Boat High will be joining us today on the Megacast as well. We'll get to all of that after this break. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Mega Cast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside Mr. Tyler Keith. I wonder about this. My uh, neighbor has uh, like a marketing company, like a promotions company. Okay. And typically they would be um, one of the companies that would go in for some of these big fan events. So if you have okay. a sporting event, um, you know, they go into like the tailgating parties and things of that nature. Um, this is a tough time right now. So excited to have our next guest on here with us, uh, Vincent Kirkwood joining us now. He's a senior director for the diversity and inclusion and consumer events for MRA experiential marketing. Uh, you're also on the West Bloomfield Parks and Recreation um, Department. So great to have you with us, Vincent. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, Ronnie? Hi, Tyler. I, I love, um, I've been on your website and you guys are so creative and some of the mobile units that you have come up with for some of these companies. For those not familiar with your company, give us a background. Sure. 
So um, again, my name is Vincent Kirkwood, Senior Director of uh, Diversity and Inclusion at MRA Mobile Experiential. And what we do at, at MRA is we build custom live uh, brand experiences for our um, for our, our clients. And our clients range from um, uh, Fortune 500 corporations uh, to you know alcohol br uh, brands. We work with uh, business to business. We work with healthcare, culture, and education. Um, so we specialize in experiential marketing, but it's typically done um, through a custom live vehicle. We've been in business for about. Um, 30, oh, I'm, I'm 35, so about 35 years. We started in 1986, <laughs> uh, and just maybe six or seven years ago, we had uh, switched ownership. But since then, we have been really moving forward with uh, and pushing the, pushing the needle, if you will, in the experiential marketing field. But looking at some of these um, trucks, so it's like one of those 18-wheelers. Yeah. Um, we've all seen them at some of these events. These are simply amazing. How do you and your team members come up with some of these designs? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. They're, they're pretty massive. And before I got into this business, I was in the field of sports and I kind of still am. I was working with the Cleveland Cavs and the Washington uh, Wizards and the Mystics. But when I came over to MRA and saw these large vehicles, I just, I couldn't believe it. I thought it would take two years to build. But to be honest with you, Ronnie, it only takes us about we could get a double expandable bill probably in 30 to 60 days. It's, it's unbelievable. So I'll just explain a little bit about our process. So we, we usually start with the client asking us, hey, you know, we want to do this. We want to reach out to our clients. We want to get that personal brand experience. And what we do is we say, okay, you know, based on what you're telling us, we think this can be done in a a smart car, a Mini Cooper, or you probably need to do it, like you mentioned, Ronnie, in a double expandable 18-wheeler. So somewhere in between that, the client finds what it is that they want to uh, put their brand in and, and tell their story in which type of vehicle. And from there, we just we go to work with our uh, content development team. We start thinking about ideas. We do a lot of whiteboard uh, narratives. We do white paper. We put out a lot of samples. If you come over to our shop over in Madison Heights, we've got carpet we've got flooring we've got paint we've got monitors we've got ceilings we've got lighting so all of those things come together just uh the making of the minds and it turns into this finished product so vincent um with that what has business been like right now in the middle of a pandemic because so many events have been closed down you know ronnie when this first started this pandemic back I want to say about a year ago yeah, today, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were in, we were, I was in North Carolina and um, I, I was trying to get back home because it's just, it was just weird. I, I've got two small kids and I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I need to get back to West Bloomfield just to feel safe and make sure they're okay. But we were in the middle of a, a CIAA, which was a, a conference in the HBCU um, league and they were doing getting ready for their their March basketball tournament and we had did a vehicle for them in collaboration with American Legacy and I flew home and that was the end of the events we were working with the NHL they were in Seattle on their mobile program and and I got a call from the NHL and they said you know what, we're going to shut it all down um, for until we know a little bit more so and we've been shut down ever since however we, we've always been busy still with taking calls. I guess that gives an opportunity for, for people to call us and see you know, for the future what, what the future of experiential marketing looks like. And we've been busy on the production side, but we just haven't been able to operate our vehicles out on the road. And it's just starting to come back alive. I've got a, two programs on the road right now. One goes to hospitals and provides food and lunches to, to uh, it's a healthcare insurance provider and they provide lunches to the uh, frontline workers and things like that. So that's one segment of what we're doing. We've got another program out for um, a, f a foundation nonprofit that talks about civil rights and uh, you know anti-Semitism and things like that that are that are in Chicago. So those are the only two I have right now. However, the company, we have probably three dozen vehicles that should be on the road right now. And, and so in the middle of a pandemic, when do you expect to get back to where we were before? You know, the, uh, I, I want to say, I want to say that, you know, summer 21, 
but I think I'm going to be take the safer route and say <laughs> spring summer 22 just because I don't I don't know you know it's it's kind of unknown the vaccine you know situation is looking very promising um, we're getting a lot of phone calls I was on a call with two potential clients just yesterday one this morning um, and they're ready people are ready to go out and you know in our in our uh, industry we focus on brand experience the touch the feel the see the hear the memorable pieces that you can take back from a brand and share that either online or in person to other people so that you know being around people in events is our lifeblood of what we do here in experiential marketing so 2022 fingers crossed but we think that we'll have some operations going on this upcoming summer 21. And are you having any of your clients utilizing other vehicles that they already have because they are kind of these freestanding, um, you know, display for, you know, a, a lack of a better word that they can take on the road and maybe it can be out in the open then for, you know, people to come through one at a time? Exactly. Uh, you're 100 percent correct. We can do that. We haven't had a lot of that just because you know, people are have been indoors. So even if you're, you know, we've been doing some, we, we came up with something really cool with one of our clients. We did a virtual tour of a vehicle. So the vehicle was parked in our facility and we had a camera and we did a virtual tour. So now you can go onto that client's website, click a button and take a virtual tour, but you're actually in the actual vehicle. So some of that we, we, we looked into early during the pandemic and now, uh, you know, we're a big billboard display. So, you know, if we did put a, a, a wrap it in a vinyl wrap and just placed it somewhere, people will see it. So um, it's definitely something that, that we've thought of and that, that clients are looking to do here in the future. Vincent Kirkwood with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion and Consumer Events at MRA Marketing and also a West Bloomfield Parks and Recreation Commissioner as well. So you, you're, you're talking about how these experiences can provide something different and unique and shareable to people with uh, within your client your clientele. And during the pandemic, as you have had clients le le more sparingly than you would have in, in normal times, how has that sure. changed the vision of your operations and how you plan these different experiences? Because people are not going to be doing these necessarily together. They're going to be taking in these experiences mm -hmm. and then going home because of the pandemic. Does that change the perspective in the planning to make those experiences that much more engaging and special? Uh, thanks, Tyler. That's a that's a great question. Um, so, like most oper you know organizations and corporations during the pandemic, we've had to shift. We've had to innovatively think about different opportunities and how we can still engage with with our clients. So, as I mentioned, uh, not too sh long ago, the, the the virtual tour we did that was the start of it. However, when we go back into real life experience and and actually at events, you know, we used to have you know. 40 to 50 people in our vehicles at one time that probably will no longer happen but now we'll just have to limit the amount of people that walk through we, we have you know when the pandemic first started we immediately added sanitation um stations where we have um you know sanitizer and and wipe down and maybe we add let two people go through the experience at a time um and we we see that continuing through the future um however i think the best thing to do is continue to do that, but still engage online. Like, what are you gonna get after the, the experience that you go through the vehicle? What are some, I wanna say leave behinds, but not necessarily things that you touch, maybe some QR codes. I know, I don't know if you guys have been to restaurants, but now you have mm -hmm. to do the QR code for, for the menu. Um, so, you know, some, some innovative things like that, maybe add more technology. Uh, maybe we do more where we don't necessarily have to go inside the vehicle and touch things, but we're, we're visually seeing things through screens. One of the programs we just put together, there's 12 LED screens inside. So, you know, you go in, you really don't have to touch anything. You kind of walk through, you listen, you look, um, and then you keep it going. And then we try to figure out ways to engage with you and to con continue the conversation of the brand once you've left the particular vehicle. And, you know, to your to your question, uh, Tyler, again, how have we changed? We've had to limit the number of people that, that work for us, of course, we've had to do that. Um, and we're hoping to get everybody back um, into the swing of things when we get moving. But, you know, as a senior director of diversity and inclusion in consumer events, I've had to think of ideas. I've had to work with content. I've had to do logistics. I've had to do spreadsheets. So we kind of, <laughs> 
share our, our role of things. And our president, Tony Amato, is, is fantastic with that. He'll, he'll jump right in as well and, and get his hands dirty. So that's the culture that we have here at this, at this organization. So, Vincent, with that, what's been a positive, do you think, that's come out of this for your company? You, you know, um, I don't know if this is a positive, but now, you know, management can see that everybody has more talents than they did originally. So that <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Like, you know, I may get asked to do something I'm like, oh, well, I don't really do this, but I guess I can. Um, so no one <laughs> I'll figure it out today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we're pushing the limits to people and, and kind of um, stretching them out. So that's a, that's a positive. But the other thing is, and more importantly, is just being innovative, always being able to stay on our feet in this industry as individuals, in the, as industry leaders, um, as a corporation, as an organization, just being able to to shift and think. You know, we're in marketing, so it is creative. And to be able to think of creative things to do, creative ways to, to engage our clients, and for creative ways so that we can share with our clients how to engage with their customers. So um, I think the innovation that has come out of this pandemic in this industry has been uh, really neat and, and really happy to see it. And hopefully we'll continue that innovation when this pandemic is over. But um, I know that you deal with companies uh, not just all across the United States, but globally as well. What's it been like to have to try to shift what you're doing for various companies and various clients in different parts of the world? Absolutely. So, you know, everyone in the world has experienced this pandemic some on greater levels than others and our company fortunately we have um we have clients that we deal with in uh, liverpool we have an office in liverpool with some partners that we work with there we're really close with our our partners in toronto we have an office in windsor we have an office here in the united states um in madison heights you know the toughest part is being able to you know prior to the pandemic we had a lot of project managers and people that will bounce back and forth from here to um to, to Canada, to Liverpool, we've, we we go to the UK often. That's all changed. There's no going over to to Canada's office and coming back here. That's that's all gone. Um, so what we try to do is those folks who live in Canada, those folks who live in Liverpool, a lot of zooms, a lot of uh, creative conversations. We starting up. We're starting a podcast um, and things like that. And and with the fact that there's not a lot of events going on, based you know in Liverpool or in the UK or in um, or in Canada. You know, we haven't had a, a huge issue with uh, having staff there because there's not much going on, but just being able to connect with those people on the different time zones via Zoom, um, that, that's been the most, uh, we've been pleased with that, being able to be able to, to do that. And we'll be able to continue that, that Zoom and that digital conversations um, even once this pandemic is over as well. So are you um, still teaching? at all? I know that you're a, a, a sports professor as well. Yes, that's correct. So I teach at Clare University and I teach at Wayne State University. My master's is in sports uh, sports administration and sports promotion. And um, I'm actually working on my PhD in sport leadership. So aside from all my sports clients with MRA and my diversity clients and things like that, uh, I'm still teaching as well. So, and Vincent, and you said you're a father as well. I'm sitting here. How many hours in the day do you have? You must have more than we do. <laughs> no, I still got the, the 24, which feels like 10, but you know, my day starts really early. I'm, I'm pretty much up at five and um, you know, my kids and my wife, I, I love spending time with them. Um, so I try to get home before bed for the most part you know fridays i try to have no meetings and try to get home early my daughter's uh zooming uh school doing zoom so um sometime during the day we'll be able to, to zoom each other and facetime and things like that but um it's busy it's busy i'm much busier now than i was before the pandemic <laughs> right. what's it been like for you uh though trying to teach right now um are you guys back in the classroom at all so at, at Cleary, we are back in the classroom. Um, however, you know, what Cleary has done is, is very innovative as far as having multi-format classes, meaning, you know, you can either come to the classroom and, and you can have class and sit in front of me and we can, you know, go over the material or we can do it just like we're doing here on a Zoom. And you have that option to be able to do either one. Um, but it's been a little bit difficult because, you know, when I used to teach prior to the pandemic, you know, I'd have a classroom full of 30 people and we'd be discussing and, you know, this person is saying this and, and that, you know, on the Zoom, 
sometimes people don't turn on their cameras, so I don't know if they're in bed or if they're asleep or if they're really there. So it's been a little bit different. And then the ones that come to the classroom, there might be two or three, so we have these small discussions. I think they're still, they're still valuable discussions. I think with the, the information that I'm providing to the students um, is valuable information. It's just uh, sometimes I feel that there's a little bit of a, a, a lack in the interpersonal that I wish we had prior to the pandemic. But again, I've created this thing called a sports conversation series where I bring in industry professionals within the sports industry to talk to the students via via Zoom. Um, and they've been really engaged. We had on our last one, we talked to Kwame Mason, who's the director and producer of uh, Soul on Ice, which is a, a hockey documentary on race and inclusivity. We had almost 50 people join that conversation. Um, and prior to that, we spoke to industry professionals from the Buccaneers um, who were in the Super Bowl. We spoke to folks from the, the Lakers. And we've had 30 people, 25 people join. So, you know, th that has been a really uh, a plus for, for, for me and for the university to be able to still engage and still introduce students to industry, industry professionals because that's, that's the experience and the connections that they need in order to grow in their careers. And do you think maybe um, had it been uh, prior to the pandemic and we were trying to do life the way we used to do it, it'd be harder to get some of these people because we would, if you were going to say, hey, we're going to have a video conference, people would be like, eh, now we're just all so <laughs> used to it. But it does make it easier to try to get some of these um, bigger, high profile individuals to come on and, and speak. Ronnie, you're, you're, you're 100% correct. I mean, I got. Um, and, and granted, some of these folks are friends of mine, but are they friends enough where they'll fly from Tampa Bay the week before the Super Bowl to talk to my students? I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, my friends are out in L.A. Are they going to fly here to talk about the Lakers after they just won the, uh, the NBA championship? I'm not sure they're going to do that. But um, like you said, the fact that it's on Zoom, I've been able to get some really great people who are interested in engaging and, and pouring into uh, young professionals, young students, in order to uh, to get them moving forward in the direction of their career that they like. Jensen Kirkwood joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion and Consumer Events at MRA Marketing and is also a West Bloomfield Parks and Recreation Commissioner as well as a, as a Sports Marketing and Promotions Associate Professor at Clary University. And to continue on at with with that angle as this pandemic has gone on we've seen that marketers and, and promoters like yourself and and your colleagues have had to change their strategies have had to change how they go about the process of providing experiences and marketing for your clients how has that changed the way that you have been teaching your students about what their industry is going to look like as they enter into promotions and marketing particularly in sports and how they're going to have to think differently based on what they've learned in the pan we've learned through the throughout the pandemic and the basics and the tried and true methods that were already in place pre-COVID. Yeah, uh, great question, and that's actually one of the questions I ask to um, the folks that join me, the industry professionals that join me in the um, in the sports conversations that we have, and and a lot of them say kind of the same thing, just always. You know, not being complacent is is the key because, you know, we nev none of us really knew this pandemic was going to come along. None of us knew that we wouldn't have fans in the in the seats. And you know, a lot of my students are you know we're sport promotion. So how do you promote a sport in an arena where there's no fans? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So again, being innovative and and the internet and using you know digital resources and things like that in order to, to continue to grow. So even myself, like before, prior to the pandemic, you know, I was, I was consciously aware of digital uh, resources that we have, but since then, we've really dove into it and, you know, dove into, you know, sport financials and, um, and sport food and beverage and, and just things like that, that we, that we understand from a different component. For example, my sport food and beverage class, we talk about, um, we, we talk about the, um, the the food and the vendors and the partners that, that bring food into the arena and things like that. So that's not happening now. So we kind of shift and talk about, you know, how does that work in the big arena? How does that work on a golf course? How does that work in a, a sports club and things like that? So, you know, looking at, at angles differently, we used to just say, okay, you bring in the food and then you have Airmark and you have Cisco, but now it's looking at it a little bit deeper. You know, how are you cutting some of the costs? And what are those 
vendors and those partners doing in the course of a pandemic, um, you know, now that they that they don't have fans. And I remember going to the Pistons game early on when they first allowed a couple of fans back in. And I just was casually going in and, and I think the second quarter I had got thirsty. And I was like, oh, let me, you know, let me go grab a water. I didn't realize that you don't get water. So I'm just sitting here the whole second half and I'm so thirsty. And it's like, wow, you never really thought about how important it is to be able to get a $6 Aquafina from the, <laughs> from the concession stand. So um, it, it just really makes you think differently and, uh, and, that, and the whole in the industry, sports, marketing, all of that. And do you think some students are saying, hey, maybe I need to change my major because I don't know where? this industry is going to go or how long it's going to take for it to bounce back? You know, that that's a great question. And, and the, the, the sports professionals that I've been able to introduce my students to have asked that question, uh, students have asked that question to them and, and most of them have, have stuck with it. They believe, the industry professionals believe that sports is not going on anywhere. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of who we are as Americans. It's a part of who, what, what we do. It's a part of our pastime. So sports is, is going to be there. It's just, is it going to look a little bit different? Perhaps for a few years it will, but it's not gonna go away. So um, my students, I'm still encouraging them to stick to it. Um, and you know, sports kind of goes a long way. It's, you know, when you think of sports and industry professionals, you think of, you know, the NHL, the NBA, the NFL, and the MLB. But a lot of times people don't think about you know affinity marketing so like if you're working with a group like chase or if you're working with um a different organization there's so much sponsorship involved in that there's so much um other things that can that are related to sports that are not just working for a professional team as tyler mentioned i'm the commissioner for the uh, parks and rec commission at um west bloomfield township and a lot of my students are interested in youth sports and and environmental sports and and things like that so i don't want to shun them away from sports just because you know you can only have 750 people in a 20,000 uh, seat arena but young people like my daughter who's who's six and my son who's two uh, my daughter starts field hockey at the end of the at the end of the month um and there has to be people who are still training her to do field hockey and pushing her to do that coaches and administrators so you know, sports looks a little bit different, but there's still so many things that 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 are youth that we need, even from PE coaches to youth coaches and youth soccer and things like that. So sports is not going anywhere, and people still want to want to get into it, and and they believe in it. And and my students, we have passion. If you're in a sports program or a sports administration program at a university, there's a, there's a lot of passion behind that. You're not just doing it because you can't think of anything to do. You've got some passion there, so they're going to stick with it. I'm hoping. And well, and we've seen, especially with the youth, um, you know, the traveling teams have been very popular this year. Yeah. So while Michigan was closed down, Ohio was open. So you, it's really exploded because parents felt the need to get their kids into some of these organized sports. A hundred percent, and I can't imagine, you know, as a youth and and Ronnie and Tyler. I don't know if you guys play youth sports, but I just couldn't imagine not being involved in, in youth sports um, as a kid. Like, I think it has shaped so much of who I am today as a father, as a leader, as a, um, as a member of a team, of a group. Um, without that, that youth sport experience, um, I, I don't think I'd be where I am today. And I, and I feel like if that was taken away from students for too long of a time, or it, it, it would be uh, detrimental into their development. Um, I was, I worked, I'm on a nonprofit called Art Road, and what Art Road does is bring art back into the schools. But if you look at art leaders, and I don't mean just, you know, painters and, and, and drawers, I mean engineers who, you know, designers, those kind of people who, if they didn't have art as a, as a youth, they wouldn't be the things that they are today. They wouldn't be these big time engineers for you know, General Motors, Ford, Tesla, these, these uh, big corporations. So you know, having, things, having involvement as a youth is really important. And, and, and I wish I could, I am working on my PhD, maybe I should study that a little bit more about the effects of youth sports um, as you go into adulthood. So thank you. I have to credit you for asking me that question, Ron. <laughs> we'll take the credit. <laughs> it's been great talking to you. We appreciate your time this morning. 
Absolutely. Thank you both. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for keeping us all up to date on on these events. I think it's well needed, and I appreciate you both. So if people want to find out more about your company, though, um, where can they do that? Sure. Um, our website is www.gomra.com. Um, you can get in touch. You know, there's a contact page. You can get in touch um, with us through there. Or you can feel free to call me directly or email me directly at v. Kirkwood, K-I-R-K-W-O-O-D at GoMRA.com as well. Love to hear from you. We so appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Tyler. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast, and when we come back, Kurt Lawson from the West Bloomfield Police Department will be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Great to have you back with us here on the Megacast. As a reminder, you can always catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. If you have cable, you can tune us in to Channel 15 on Comcast, 99 on AT&T, and you can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. And then today, we are also live streaming today's edition of the Megacast on the West Bloomfield Township Clerk's Office. So we want to say thank you for, to them for allowing us uh, to do so. With us now, our good friend Kurt Lawson over at the West Bloomfield Police Department. Always great having you with us. It's always nice to see you, and I'm glad to see you're back in the studio. <laughs> I will say, though, uh, I was kind of used to wearing my pajama bottoms. Uh, I know you like those slippers. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, um, for any guy out there that is looking for a gift for, uh, you know, your significant other, Ugg slippers. They are the best things. My sister got a, uh, got us all of them a few years ago for Christmas. They are by far the best slippers worth the money, uh, and they last for years. So there you go. My tip of the day for uh, all you Thanks. all you guys out there. And the deputy chief loves those kind of slippers and be great in my office. So I'll have to <laughs> There you go. Hey, Kurt, uh, I was on your um, Facebook page. You guys are doing a new video series. Tell us about that. Well, we're just always looking for ways and how we can reach the community and get and push information out. Obviously, uh, we use the Megacast quite often and you guys are a great platform, uh, but we're just looking for other avenues to, to get information out. Uh, we've had some issues with fraud over the last year and a half and really seen a significant uptick lately. So we really want to push that, that messaging out. But it's great to hear directly um, from you and members of your team. So when it comes to fraud, any specific types of cases that you're seeing or is it all over the board? Well, really, it, it runs the gamut, right? So we have uh, 475 different fraud 
cases against our residents last year alone. And this year we're already up over 80. So this is a phenomenon that's not going to stop. It just continues to increase. And uh, you know, criminals are very creative. So they have all these different ways on how they're trying to take money from, uh, from individuals. But we just wanna warn our residents that no legitimate company, no legitimate law enforcement agency is going to call you and on the phone and ask you for your personal information or ask you to go buy gift cards or send them Bitcoin or give them your credit card number. I, they are good though. Some of these emails yeah. that come across, uh, you can fall victim to them. I mean, myself, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. In fact, um, Deputy Chief, my husband, he was the victim of one of these scams uh, a few weeks ago. And I made him do a story with Fox too. He was so embarrassed. And I said, no, you know, That's you important. need to do it and share your story because there are going to be yeah. other people and maybe you can help with this. But it was through like a Microsoft um, email that came through and then he called them. No, two weeks later, I get the same email and I almost fell for it. Now, I would never actually go out and buy gift cards for anyone, um, you know. And if I was home, he wouldn't have either. Uh, but but they, they look so real. So how can people tell a difference? Well, like I said, if someone's calling you at your home and asking for personal information, that's your first clue. But you're exactly right. These individuals, they do this all day long and they've gotten very good at it. They have a number of different scams and they're very persistent and they get very pushy and they're, they're moving you very quickly. And a lot of times they're using fear tactics. And one of the things that really concerns us right now, and I just got done doing an interview with uh, WDIB, was that individuals are calling victims and saying that they're from the federal government, whether it's the FBI, the DEA, the IRS. And they're saying, you know, we have a warrant for your arrest or your son, your granddaughter has been arrested and you need to post bond for them. Another one we've seen quite often is a vehicle has been stopped in a different state. It's filled with drugs. Uh, you have a warrant for your arrest. You have to post bond. Now, if you're someone that is uh, not familiar with this, the fact that this is going on, this is gonna create anxiety. And we see time and time again, especially with our elderly, uh, individuals going to uh, the CVS or Walgreens buying gift cards and sending them to these individuals because you know they, they obviously care about their granddaughter or their grandson and uh, they don't understand that they're being scammed. How are they getting the information of like the name of their grandkids? Now, that's a great, great uh, question. And I think there's a number of ways they do this. A lot of it is data mining. You know, with the internet these days, you can find out anything. A lot of times my officers tell me they don't wanna be on social media here at the police department because they don't want anyone to see their face. I said, well, why don't you go Google yourself? You're all over the place, right? So there's information on the internet that people can, can mine uh, and, and you can pay you know, a certain amount of money and certain platforms to come up with all that information. Yeah, it is pretty easy. Um, for uh, anyone out there, you can set up a Google alert for yourself so you can put it uh, I have one for my name so if my name comes up then I get an alert uh, to you know see where it popped up does it's not a hundred percent but still it's a good thing for people to uh, know what's going on out there um, with that Kurt Lawson with us here on the mega cast he's the deputy chief for the West Bloomfield Police Department I know that around the holidays porch pirates are always a big deal is that still an issue it seems like um, Amazon trucks are still circling the neighborhood just as busy as holiday season or not. Well, they arrive at my house house quite often. Uh, I think with what you've seen, I think we've seen a reduction in the fact that we've had larcenies from these type of packs just because so many people have cameras now on their house, right? So the, the ring video, uh, the different camera systems that you could buy is something like Costco. So I think that's been somewhat of a deterrent. So we haven't seen uh, a huge uptick in that here in West Bloomfield. I, I don't know if you've seen the video that's been going around, uh, Kurt, around social media. And uh, someone in Detroit, uh, they came to take the package off of the guy's porch. And he came out with, let's say, a very large gun. <laughs> and that person returned that package quickly. <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, I, some people don't mess around with them, right? Okay. Uh, because that is one thing when you have the ring cameras, uh, it, it will alert you to let you know that uh, someone is on your porch. You know what's so great about our community is everyone kind of watches out for each other. 
and we have a great partnership with our community. So many times there'll be a neighbor that just looks at their, their neighbor to the left and they you know, that, that vehicle doesn't look like it belongs there. I've never seen that vehicle there. And people have no issue with giving us a call and we actually encourage that. Uh, we'll come out right away and, and check somebody out. Um, one of the other things I know that we try to do in our neighborhood as well is, uh, you know, if your neighbor has a package and you know they're not going to be home all day, is always um, we'll either take it and put it into our house and say, hey, we have your package over here, or try to at least hide it so it's not so visible as well. Great idea. Uh, do you guys have like a um, like a some type of system there at the police department for people to you know get packages or you know or if they're going to be buying and selling things online to meet with people up there at the police department so many times we see especially on like facebook marketplace um we have a spot right in front of our station that people often meet i would say on a weekly basis uh it's a well lit um it's quite a few people around public area where you can come uh, meet the other person that you're going to do a transaction with. It's a safe environment, and we actually encourage that. Uh, we have done investigations in the past where uh, an in individual will meet uh, someone else in a mall parking lot or um, on a side street somewhere, and then you know there's a theft that takes place or they get robbed. So we encourage uh, residents if they're going to engage in these transactions, feel free to come to the police department, our front parking lot. We have cameras everywhere. It's a safe environment for you. And it's also a good way to know that you're not going to get scammed. But also, uh, a lot of people have the porch pickup where they'll throw it out on their porch. But uh, for us, I don't like anyone to know my address. It's like you said, it's not hard to actually find it if you want to. But still, having them come to your house, right. I think it's a little bit different because they're strangers. Of course. Totally agree. So what, well, else, is, what else is up over there at the uh, good old police department, Kurt? Well, I just want to circle back for a quick second on the fraud because we had an incident the other day that was, was quite concerning. So we had a, a young lady, 25 year old, that lives in West Bloomfield, and she got one of these calls from a quote unquote federal agent that told her that a vehicle was stopped in Texas, like I said earlier, that uh, it was filled with drugs and that she had an arrest warrant for, for herself. Now she's got a small baby. Uh, she's now panicking, like what is going on? Uh, he's very convincing gives her his ID number, uh, where he works. The number that he called on was actually spoofed to the Department of Justice real phone number. Wow. So, you know, he's telling her, you have got to send these gift cards to us to help pay a bond on your warrant. And uh, you know what, she, she was hesitant. She thought this was a scam. Two hours later, two gentlemen show up at her door. One that identified himself as a police officer and one that identified, identified himself as an FBI agent. And it was at that point where uh, she did, in fact, um, give them the money, uh, you know, over the phone, uh, some gift cards. So that concerns us because that's definitely an escalation of what we've seen before. We see these phone scams day in and day out. Uh, the, you know, someone falls victim on a daily basis. It could be $1,500. We've had people $15,000. But when people are actually, suspects are actually, actually showing up at your doorstep, that's a concern and that's what we want our residents to know about. And if anyone like that shows up, you need to call 911 immediately. Wow, I've never heard of them actually coming to your door. Um, did they have any type of identification and what happens if you can catch some of these people? What charges do they face? So the one individual that said he was an FBI agent did not show any ID or anything like that. So we would encourage uh, you know, people to ask for identification if there's any doubt close the door, call your local police department. The second subject had some sort of uniform on. He's the one that said he was a West Bloomfield police officer. And they actually had a blue car out front that was unmarked. Uh, so she actually thought that this was a legitimate um, you know, law enforcement official. Uh, and that's where they're really, they're really pushing that envelope. They're really using those scare tactics and intimidation. And it's very concerning. Yeah, because if they're um, caught, wouldn't that be impersonating a law enforcement officer? Well, there's going to be a number of charges for these individuals, and a lot of them are going to be felonies. But, uh, you know, these cases are very difficult. We're one of the few departments that have the capability to investigate fraud. Uh, it takes a lot of manpower, women power. It's expensive. Uh, you have to use a lot of technology. But many times, after even two months of investigation, we'll find a lot of these cases end up being from Nigeria or South America or the U.K. And obviously, there's not much we can do about that. But these two individuals that showed up at the front door of one of our residents, uh, they're local, 
and we're doing our best to locate them. That is really scary, and it is hard because uh, it's like you said with so many of these fraud cases, they're not even in the United States. So there's so little that can be done and uh, pretty much guarantee that you're not getting the money back. Many times, you know, the victims don't get the money back. We have a, a detective that's on a task force with Secret Service is based out of Novi. Uh, so we have a really close relationship. Uh, they handle a lot of frauds, and we're able to uh, you know, at times go out of state, go international uh, through that platform, but it is very difficult. And there's so many small law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Michigan, and, and they just can't investigate these type of crimes. Kurt Lawson here with us on the Mega Cast. He's a deputy chief over at the West Bloomfield Police Department. Um, how's hiring going right now over at the police department? Well, like all police departments, uh, probably throughout the country, and especially in Michigan, it's been a heavy lift. Uh, we have right now, the last I checked, uh, 10 people that'll be interviewing for a police officer. Uh, we probably had maybe 20 or 30 that applied. Now you compare that to 1994 when I started, there was 250 people that applied. So we are continue to have a difficult time uh, attracting the top tier talent, uh, but we are not going to hire here until we find that top 1%. Uh, the one positive thing I have seen, however, has been an increase in number of women that have applied. Uh, which is uh, exciting for us because you know we want to represent our community and uh, we've had some great candidates so give us a breakdown of the process how long does it take well it's a process that takes uh several months so you, you have to do the advertisement for for a period of time uh, whether it's 30 days or 60 days then you have to do the testing process make sure they're, we call MCOLs certified. They've, they've taken the MCOLs test, they've taken a physical fitness test. And then we have to go through the oral interview process, which we do right here in-house. And then we obviously obviously have to do a comprehensive background check. And that could take you know two weeks to a month. Kurt Lawson with us here on the Megacast. It's always great talking to you. If people want to find out more about uh, the possibility of joining your team, how can they do that? Well, they have to get a hold of our HR department right here at the West Bloomfield Town Hall, uh, or they can call the West Bloomfield Police Department. We'll guide them to the right people. And if they need any in more information about fraud, uh, check out our social media platforms. We're gonna have more information on there. And if you're a victim, uh, you know, please reach out to law enforcement, report it. My greatest concern is that even though we see these cases every day, I think this is happening even more often than we know because people are embarrassed. They don't wanna tell their family members uh, but we really need to know and we want to investigate it the best we can for our for our residents. Is it important for people to uh, file a police report? It is. Uh, you're going to need that later on to try to reimburse money, especially if you're uh, giving them your visa number or they've gotten into your bank accounts. So feel free. We'll take the report anytime. We'll come to you if we have to. Um, we're here for, the, for our residents. You're listening to 89.3 WBL Deer Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. Uh, Deputy Chief, anything maybe we didn't touch on that you want to share before we say goodbye to you today? Well, I know that like you, uh, we're pretty happy that the restaurants are opening back up a little bit more. We're at 50%. Uh, we've had great compliance throughout this whole COVID uh, situation over the past, you know, over a year now. So I'm glad to see that the COVID numbers are still on their way down. Uh, people continue to wear their masks to keep that social distance. And uh, we've seen more vaccine sites open uh, throughout the state and specifically Oakland County. So I think that's all, those are all positives. So I think we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Let's hope so, fingers crossed. It's hard to believe it's been a year. I know, it's been a long year. Yeah, remember, it's been a long two weeks. <laughs> yeah, 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 it has. Well, we wanna say thank you again. We always appreciate your time. It's great to see both of you. Have a great day. Kurt Lawson, uh, Deputy Chief over at the West Bloomfield Police Department. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, we will be speaking with Joe Baldman over at the Chamber of Commerce. This is the Oakland County Megacast. 89.3 Lakes FM invites you to submit nominations for the Greater West Bloomfield Michigan Week Community Awards. Now until Monday, March 8th at 1159 p.m. Nominate someone you know in the community who is making a difference in Greater West Bloomfield as we celebrate our local volunteers. To learn more and make nominations, visit michiganweek.org and join us for the Michigan Week Community Awards May 19th on 89.3 Lakes FM. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the Medical Director for the Oakland County Health Division. 
the most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Welcome back to the second hour of the Oakland County Megacast. As always, you can catch Tyler and myself Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon, Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. You can also tune us in to the cable channels, uh, 15 if you have Comcast 99 on AT&T. Listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. Good news for a lot of the uh, restaurants uh, this week when the governor announced that she is going to ease slightly some of the restrictions. Uh, capacity starting Friday will be 50%. Uh, some of the uh, restrictions and the capacity limits were also um, reduced for uh, some of the businesses as well. And I will say a lot of times I forget about the businesses, Tyler, because there's been so much focus on the restaurants. Um, and I, I don't know, every time I'm at Home Goods, there's a huge line, so I don't know about those capacity limits. Yeah, we seem to have heard so much more from the restaurants about the hardships they've faced during this pandemic that we kind of do forget about retail and we kind of do forget about other shops. And like John McNamara was mentioning yesterday about those hotels and those catering businesses and those banquet halls who have had equal struggles to those of restaurants. Yeah, so hopefully though with the um, vaccine, um, we're going to get to the back end of this pandemic. With us now, let's bring in our good friend, Joe Ballman. He's the president for the Birmingham and Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce. Always great having you with us. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, always glad to be here. Uh, you always have the coolest background. That looks awesome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, tell us, what's, uh, what's going on over there in your neck of the woods? So yes, um, the governor's uh, rulings earlier this week about easing some of the restrictions is going to be gratefully uh, helpful to uh, our member restaurants, retail, um, spas, salons, workout facilities. Um, we're, we're grateful that, that they have the opportunity to increase their capacity. Um, but significant challenges remain uh, to all of our businesses. Um, this morning, actually, uh, this is very timely. The Birmingham Bluefield Chamber is one of six uh, chambers throughout the state of Michigan in conjunction with the state, uh, Michigan Chamber of Commerce. We launched what we're calling our Reopen Michigan Safely initiative, and it is specifically targeted towards reopening offices and allowing employees to come back to work. Um, you may not be aware, but uh, we are still under a very strict, the most strict, order in the entire country right now in terms of uh, mandating those who can work from home have to work from home. That order is up for review and expiration in on a, April 14th. And we believe that um, it's critically imperative that employers uh, be allowed to reopen their offices in a safe manner and allow employees to come back because without the offices um, being uh, full with with workers, our restaurants and our retail and our downtown specifically will continue to suffer greatly because they just don't have that customer base anymore. Yeah, I think about some of these office buildings that have like the small deli down, mm -hmm. you know, stairs or, you know, they offer lunch and breakfast and things of that nature. Those businesses have to be pretty much non-existent right now without people in these office buildings. Sure, and you know, 
first and foremost, we want to make sure that our employees and our offices stay safe. But you might recall back in April, um, every business in Michigan was required to develop and file a COVID plan with the state of Michigan as to how they were going to operate their business in a safe and efficient manner, both for the employers, the employees, and then any guests you may have in your place of business. So everybody already has a plan in place, and it came from OSHA and it came from the CDC. So our businesses, our offices are ready to reopen, but they're not allowed to. And all we're asking is that they be given the opportunity to develop a plan with their employees, something that everybody can be comfortable with and, and start to reopen. Because um, if you go into downtown Birmingham, it's very quick and easy to see the devastating effect. Hundreds of thousands of square feet of empty offices brought Many of the um, what I call the fast casual restaurants that relied on those office workers for lunch have either closed temporarily, they never reopened when they were allowed to, or they've closed permanently. And also what I would define as the finer dining restaurants with liquor licenses that used to be open um, for lunch and dinner, almost every single one of them now is closed for lunch and are only open for dinner and, and on a much um, reduced schedule in terms of days of the week. Similarly, with our retailers, if you go to the local jewelry store, um, clothing store, whatever it is, they've greatly slashed their staff, they've reduced their hours, they've reduced the number of days that they're open because they just don't have that critical mass of office workers supporting their businesses. And we're afraid that if the governor chooses to extend this ban for another six months, it will have a catastrophic effect on the downtowns in terms of them being able to stay viable regardless of the loosening of the restrictions and the capacity. So, uh, Joe, are there any discussions right now with any member of the governor's team? Because if we're pushing for kids to get back into the classrooms, why aren't we allowing for adults to get back into the office buildings, especially so many of these offices are set up in a way that um, you can be, you know, kind of at a distance from one another? Great question. So uh, for whatever reason, the state of Michigan is the only state in the country that still has a mandatory work from home order. The governor did announce that she has created a work group to study the issue. Um, and while that's great, and while the local chambers of commerce and the Michigan Chamber of Commerce wants to support and participate in that event, we feel that it's probably about nine months too late. I mean, we've had a whole year um, to try to figure this out in six months, certainly since the ban went in place. So while we're glad that it's being considered, um, we worry that it's going to further bog down the reopening um, and delay giving businesses and their employees the ability to decide for themselves what makes the most sense for them, provided they can do it in a safe manner that follows, uh, like I said, the OSHA guidelines and CDC. So what are some of the fines for businesses that um, are caught in violation? Because it seems like a lot of the focus has just been on the restaurant industry because they can kind of hold that liquor license over the owner's heads. Whereas if I'm in an office building, what, you know, is it typically sure. like a, you know, a thousand dollar fine? And is that coming from the state or your local health department? Um, so it is a monetary fine. It is coming from the state. Our issue is that, you know, for the, for the vast majority of people, they want to do the right thing and they want to follow the rules, right? And so, yes, it would be easier for a business to bring its employees back into their office because they're not as visible. And so, you know, who would know unless somebody turned you in to the state, mm. um, you, you may get away with it. But people don't want to be placed in the position of having to break the law. Um, they, they don't want to have to do that. And so what all we're asking is to um, allow employers to go back to what we were asked to do last April in coming up with a mitigation plan, a COVID protection plan, and then let employers and employees figure out themselves what makes the most sense. We're not saying everybody should go back 100% to their office. Um, we have learned that people can be productive in a remote atmosphere, but we've also learned 
that there are obstacles to that. And people are really feeling, we've heard a lot about how kids are suffering from a lack of socialization. Well, guess what? So are, so are office workers, um, people who want to be with their coworkers and they want to be with their bosses. They're feeling a lot of that separation anxiety as well. And so all we're asking is to give companies an opportunity to come up with a plan that makes collective bargaining situation, then obviously whichever union that represents your employees is also going to have a say in it ultimately. Right. I mean, if we can do a hybrid plans for our schools and get, a, you know, to get our kids back into the classroom, it seems like there should be some type of at least that discussion coming up in our workplaces as well. And, you know, um, and we believe that a lot of times people take their cue from government. As part of this, we would like to see the state of Michigan um, develop, or if they've already developed, share with everyone what their plan is for bringing state employees back to their facilities. Um, you have a situation like in Lansing, the state government is Lansing's number one employer. 20,000 people um, support the business community in Lansing. Well, guess what? All state government offices, except for Secretary of State and some other emergency ones, remain open. There's been no discussion as to when state employees may come back, and we think that's an important part of it as well. Yeah, and, you know, and while they are saying that uh, the services are still open and they're just doing it different, they're doing it uh, remotely, uh, some people that have tried to have you know, navigate to getting a hold of people, uh, it can be a little bit tricky. I mean, even when your offices are open, when it comes to government, it can be hard to, uh, you know, get through the red tape. So there are so many new le uh, layers to this whole debacle as well with some of the state uh, employees. And so with that, Joe, oh, what's new there in uh, Birmingham, Bloomfield area as far as businesses? Any new businesses opening right now? Yeah, so we're very excited. Um, as of Friday, I guess, the, the open date, and I believe that um, your show is going to be doing a, a segment and a tour. So we're very excited about the opening of the new Daxton Hotel in downtown Birmingham. Uh, this is a project that is almost three years in the making. It's right in the heart of downtown, um, right at, um, I guess it would be Old Woodward and Merrill. Um, where uh, the old um, where Manuel uh, real estate office was, it's a beautiful hotel full of amenities, really a crown jewel. Um, the the ownership group is the same group that uh, opened the Foundation Hotel in downtown Detroit with the apparatus room. So if you're familiar with that hotel, um, similar but even nicer and better and more exquisite. And so they're getting ready to have a soft open on March 10th and their restaurant will either open at that point or a little later as well. So that it's a beautiful, faci beautiful facility, beautiful hotel. So we're very excited about that. A tough time um, to be opening up a new hotel, though. It is. And I think they, frankly, if they had wanted to, they could have um, opened a little sooner they, than they did. But obviously, you're right that it was a tough environment to open in, not only because of lack of business travel, which I think they will rely on significantly, but also it, it's tough trying to recruit a workforce right now. And so, but they have met those challenges and uh, they're very excited about, uh, about becoming uh, a new crown jewel in downtown Birmingham. That's awesome. Um, we'll look forward to that because, yeah, it's like you said, the Fountain Hotel in downtown Detroit, uh, it is beautiful. It's the old uh, firehouse uh, yes. down there across from I, well, to me, it's always Cobo, but I guess it's the TCF Center now. Sure. You know, and just like it's always going to be Pine Knob. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how about uh, anything else, though, Joe? Uh, any other good news? I know that uh, we've seen some businesses close. Sure, we have, and I mentioned, you know, the, the restaurants. We have said goodbye to several restaurants. Um, for coffee lovers, we do have a new coffee roaster and uh, coffee shop in downtown Birmingham called Seven Sisters. So that's very exciting. Um, we have the French Lady, which is a French patisserie and uh, little cafe has opened in downtown Birmingham. So we're encouraged by the fact that we are starting to see uh, a little uptick in activity in terms of new businesses opening. Certainly nothing like it was pre-pandemic and it's gonna take, it's gonna take a while. Um, and so what we're really focused on at the chamber 
is really supporting our existing members and making sure they have all the tools um, that they, and information that they need to try to, to make it out through the other end. We're very encouraged by, you know, vaccines continue to ramp up and we feel that as more and more um, people get vaccinated, people will be more comfortable um, moving out and about and uh, we'll, we'll put this uh, truly dark uh, now year long uh, chapter behind all of us. I'm sure all of us are really tired of this and are really um, tired of hearing, you know, the words uh, unprecedented and pivot and, you know, whatever else you want to say. But um, having said that, we also want to encourage people to continue to do what they need to do to keep everybody safe, um, which is continue to social distance, continue to wear a mask and continue to wash your hands and do all the things we can because the more we protect, the the quicker we'll get rid of the virus. Yeah, and um, you know, and the big thing too is to remember, continue to support our local shops and businesses because so many people are you know getting fatigued, right. and they're forgetting uh, about these local business owners, and we need them to survive because they make up the uniqueness of our neighborhoods. I mean, small business is the backbone of the economy. It's also the backbone of unique downtown areas, right? National chains are great, but it's really the small businesses, the entrepreneurial led mom and pop shops that lead that unique flavor. I'll just add one more thing. Um, not only do we need to support our small businesses, we need to be kind to their employees and we need to be patient. Um, you know, again, with retail and restaurants, I know all of them have significantly slashed their staffs because they just can't afford them. And so it might take a little longer to place your order. It might take a little longer to get your food. Um, but you know what? They're doing the best they can under very trying circumstances. They're, they're literally putting their safety um, you know, before you by, by continuing to work as an essential employee. So be kind, be patient, and be generous in your tipping when you are uh, visiting one of our great local restaurants. Well, Joe, it's been great talking to you as always, and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing uh, behind the scenes there for so many of these businesses to keep them up and running during this time. I do want to mention very briefly, I have to give a plug. If you are interested in our effort to reopen the offices, please visit the website, reopenmichigansafely.com. There's all kinds of information there. There's a sample letter you can send to your elected officials to encourage them to, uh, to open up our offices. That's good, uh, good information. Thank you so much, Joe, again, for being with us. We so appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Joe Bowman, or Bowman with us here on the Megacast. He's the president for the Birmingham and Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce. They're doing uh, so many things over there to try to help our businesses survive. So check them out uh, when you get a chance. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the managing partner for Blue Skies Brewery and Michigan by the Bottle. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now, it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. 
and shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries. But you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside Mr. Tyler Keith. As a reminder, we are always here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. But if for some reason you are unable to tune into a portion of the show, you can always find our previous interviews and previous shows on CivicCenterTV.com. So speaking about some of those businesses trying to survive, while it seems as if the governor has kind of thrown a lifeline to some of the restaurants um, by allowing them to reopen, and now she has increased capacity to 50%. It is still a struggle. With us now on the show, Courtney Casey. She's the managing partner for the Blue Skies Brewery and Michigan by the Bottle. So great to have you with us again. Thank you so much for having me back, Ronnie. <laughs> so I know the last time we talked, uh, you guys were trying to get online to be able to get some of the grant money. How is that going? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was hit or miss with some of the grants, um, you know, but we're just grateful for, for every little bit that we can get. And uh, we were very fortunate to get the second PPP loan. Uh, so that has really been a lifesaver. Uh, we're very grateful for that. So <laughs> it's been an interesting few months for sure. <laughs> right. It's almost as if you have to become an expert and trying to get the grants because the money runs out so quickly. Yeah, and every one of them is different, you know, and, and one of the struggles we're finding with um, Blue Skies, you know, Michigan by the Bottle has been around for, for over eight years now, and um, so we qualify for a lot of these grants. Uh, Blue Skies, we opened this location in Auburn Hills in during the pandemic, you know, during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, May 7th, the day that construction restarted, was the day that we actually opened for curbside carryout um, because we had some construction delays. So because we weren't open in 2019, we weren't eligible for a lot of the grants. So that just added another layer of, of complication uh, to everything because they want to see like what your profits were in 2019 and that sort of thing and we have nothing to show them because we weren't open yet so right and it's so hard to actually get a person on the phone yeah. to be able to discuss some of these issues yeah it's really difficult I have to give the credit to my husband Shannon because he's become our full-time uh, grant application manager <laughs> that's his new job so he's done a great job so we're grateful for every every little bit that we can get and, and especially the support of all of our patrons for continuing to come out out supporting our virtual events and you know when we were shut down coming out for curbside and now thankfully being able to come out and uh, and dine inside so so tell us how things have been going since uh, you've been allowed to reopen to indoor dining it's it's been up and down which is kind of like the story of you know this corona year um i found this time around people seem more um willing to come out right away you know i feel like after the last shutdown i think because it obviously it was a very new situation for everybody it really was hard to get people in and feeling comfortable about everything that we were doing to keep people safe this time i feel like uh, people know the protocol they know the drill we've done this before right so they they know how we operate they know that we're doing everything right um so it has been easier to get people to come in um but it's still a struggle because you know that 25 percent capacity until tomorrow um that's it's not a lot for restaurants and, and we're very grateful to be able to operate at that capacity but that 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 is still a really difficult number so we are really looking forward to this 50 percent capacity um, but i know your last guest was mentioning uh you know 
how a lot of places have had to let people go uh, because they just don't have the budget for it. And there's a, there's another level to that that I think we've discussed on our on our, my previous visits here was that not only do a lot of people have to let a lot of places have to let people go, but that there's a lot of people that don't want to work in this industry anymore um, because either they just they don't want to be the guy that has to tell people to wear masks or they don't feel comfortable being in the public or a lot of our employees who have left they have new circumstances in their lives triggered by the pandemic whether it's child care um, some kind of a familial situation they're taking care of older parents and they don't want to go out you know without being vaccinated um, so that's added just another level of complication is trying to find people to work when you need the employees so <laughs> And there's so much uncertainty around the industry because what if the numbers go up again and you get shut down again? It's that yeah. cycle and that uncertainty that makes it hard for people to say, I'm going to stay in this business if they don't have to. Right. It's, it's a hard it's a hard job to count on right now. And, and honestly, I'm a little scared. I did not think under my wildest dreams that we would be allowed to go back to 50% capacity before St. Patrick's Day. Because if you remember last year, we were shut down fully the day before St. Patrick's Day. And I think a lot of us believe that was, you know, to keep people from going out and celebrating on St. Patrick's Day, understandably, because people go out and have lots of drinks and get close together and pack in crowds. Um, so I really didn't think that was going to happen before St. Patrick's Day. So I'm really hoping that because this was allowed before St. Patrick's Day, that we don't end up hearing from the state that, well, everybody was not very, uh, very well behaved on St. Patrick's Day, and now we have to go back to 25%, you know? So that's the roller coaster we're on right now, and I'm just hoping that this is only going back to normal from here, or, or gradually going back to normal from here, and not just gonna go up and down, up and down, you know? <laughs> I'm with you, I was really surprised. I thought yeah. if she, you know, reduced the restrictions, it wouldn't take effect until after St. Patty's Day. Right, exactly, I was, I was completely shocked. So, and grateful, but just, I'd rather, yeah. I'd rather keep it at 25 if we're just going to go back to 25 later, but hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully we're going to just keep progressing from here, and, and I'm trying to have faith in that. <laughs> Courtney Casey with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the managing partner for Blue Skies Brewery and Michigan by the Bottle. Uh, with that, Courtney, what has been the response been from the public having to close at 10 o'clock? You know, at Michigan by the Bottle, it hasn't been a problem because we do close at 10 on the weekends and 9 on, the, on Wednesday and Thursday. So that hasn't affected us, us at all. Um, Blue Skies, it did significantly affect our hours and we needed to move up some of the concerts and everything. But, you know, we haven't heard a lot of um, negative feedback or anything from the customers, probably because they, they, they understand it's not anything that we can control. So I think I think a lot of people are kind of exasperated by it, you know, um, feeling like they're kind of they've got a curfew with their mom and dad but but at the same time um i think they they don't really express a lot of uh, feelings toward uh, to us about it because we can't control it so we've just kind of rolled with it i mean i feel like we've changed our hours at blue skies like six times which is not really um how i like to do business obviously i want to be very I mean, my job is the marketing i want to be clear and communicate with our customers and so it's, it's kind of hard to be like okay well this week we're open until this time but um but they get it they understand you know this week we are going to start extending our hours until 11 on friday and saturday and kind of go from there uh, but we've actually had a really good response to our live music and everything and um even though it's starting an hour earlier i actually feel like we're getting um much more steady um attendance at those um and then we've actually had to turn people away which sometimes people are upset by that i think they want us to to just kind of like slide under the bar but but it's it's obviously very important i mean people um are watching you know and i want to do the right thing i want to make sure that we can stay open so as as frustrating as it is to have to turn away customers you know and especially at this time when we really need the business um hopefully people understand that we can't control that so Right, because at the end of the day, it's a risk to your liquor license, and that's the last yeah. thing uh, you right. need. Uh, so with that, um, how is it going for you and the team in trying to secure enough employees? It, it's been hard. We have a few interviews this week, so that's making me hopeful. Um, and, you know, but it, it's usually we get a lot more applications than this when we put out a call for, for positions. And, and I do feel like there's still a lot of hesitancy um, for those hospitality jobs. And, and maybe this is because I'm a glutton for punishment, but I'm actually uh, a partner in another project that's opening um, within Blue Skies. We're doing a coffee bar called Layover, um, and that's going to be opening in the spring. So we're actually hiring for that, too. So <laughs> now we're looking for baristas, too. So uh, we're just trying to make our lives more and more complicated. Yes. <laughs> hospitality businesses are a very complicated industry right now. 
now, but we kept, we keep doing it. We must be crazy. I don't know. <laughs> but do you find that people are so eager to get out of the house yes. now, even more yes. so than I think that first go around because yes. we're just all tired and you want that experience of going out and eating and talking with people. <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I do feel like, like you said, I think it's even more this time around. So even though um, this pause <laughs> was shorter, um, I think because last year we were getting in the spring and people could kind of go outside and they kind of alleviated some of their distress about the pandemic that way. And, and now it's, you know, it's been winter. It's not, unless you're a winter lover, which I'm most definitely not, um, you know, this is not the, the time to hang out outside with your friends or or go take a nice hike or something, you know? So it's like, I think people were really getting stir crazy in their houses. And and we saw when we, I believe since the last time I was on the show, we, we actually added the winter wine bubbles outside at Michigan by the Bottle so people can reserve those bubbles for their quarantine pod or their household. And we those went crazy over, you know, the coldest weeks because we had heaters. People could feel like they were outside. They could feel like they were with their friends, but they didn't have to worry about being around other people or being in a large room. And, and so those were very, very popular. Um, yeah, people are just are ready to get on with life. And, and, and luckily, so many people I know are getting the vaccines. And I think I think it's only going to be better from here, hopefully, as more and more people get vaccinated and we can start getting slowly back to, to real life, so to speak. Do you think that they should add people that work uh, in the hospitality industry as some of those essential workers to get the vaccine earlier? I mean, I'm completely biased in this regard, <laughs> right. but, 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 you know, yes, I, I do. I would really like to see that. Um, I'm sure everybody kind of feels that way, that their their particular industry, you know, deserves that priority. Um, but, but my team members are out in the public every day, you know, uh, serving people at their tables and, um, I know some of them have already gotten it, luckily, because some, you know, for a lot of them, this is their second job. So we do have some healthcare workers, we have some teachers, so they've already got them. Um, but it would be nice if we could um, get our team vaccinated. It's definitely something that I'm keeping an eye on for all of our team members, keeping them updated, watching the Macomb and Oakland County uh, websites to see when that might open up, encouraging them to register with all the entities they can. Since we do have locations in Oakland and Macomb, they would be eligible uh, for either county if uh, if they open it up for restaurant workers. So we're really hoping that will be soon. <laughs> right, and um, with that, tell us more about uh, live music returning. Uh, is it yeah. hard to book people right now or are there are so many people eager to get back to playing. It's actually easier to book people right now because a lot of places aren't having live music, uh, especially with the 25% capacity. Um, so I, I had our musicians, we kind of have a, a steady roster of musicians and I keep adding to it as I meet new people, but we have a really um, you know, reliable list of musicians. And uh, so they've been, they reached out right away, you know, the, the saying, we understand if you're not doing live music, but if you are, we would love to come in. So we are having really good luck um, with the musicians and people are loving it. You know, people are, like you said, people want to get out. They want to be able to, uh, to, to see entertainment and, and have fun. So um, that's been going really, really well. There are a few things that replace live music, right? It's like just such a different energy when yeah. you can listen to live music. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so um, with that, um, going forward, how long do you think uh, you can survive at 50% capacity? I think we're going to be okay. Just, uh, I'm very fortunate in that my husband in a previous life was a banker, so he's very uh, financially savvy, and I'm the kind of creative end, and he's the logistics end. So he's he set us up pretty well, where I think we'll be okay for a while. But uh, just definitely need that continued support of our, our guests, which we really appreciate. Um, you know, it's definitely not going to be the most lucrative few years <laughs> for sure. We're just trying to survive at this point, not not uh, not rolling in the hundies over here. But um, but we're, we are, you know, I think we'll be okay. And I think the the, the exciting thing too is that. The city of Auburn Hills has continued to um, try to evolve the downtown, which was an ongoing project before the pandemic. And um, there's a lot of exciting new projects going on down here. And so I think that, you know, seeing that forward progress is really encouraging even amid a pandemic. And so I think once we get some more businesses down here in downtown Auburn Hills, which is definitely a, a major priority for the city, I think we'll be seeing even more and more um, customers, more and more traffic, and they're building tons of new residential down here. Uh, so I think things are gonna be looking up from here, I'm, I'm hopeful. 
We are all hopeful, fingers crossed. Uh, quickly, Courtney, before we let you go, with some of the upcoming live music bands, do people need to make a reservation to be able to get uh, into no. your uh, restaurant, or is it just it's first come, first serve? It's first come, first served. And right now we're not doing music at MBTV, which we hope to continue soon. We're having some discussions now that we're gonna be at 50%. Um, but at Blue Skies, we are doing it on Thursday nights. Every Thursday we have a, our house band, which is Pinter Whitnick. They're a D Detroit-based duo. They're fantastic. They do a different theme every week. Um, and then on Saturdays, we have rotating musicians. And that's our seven to 9.30 are the concerts. So it's just first come, first serve. There's no cover charge. Uh, and we do have non-alcoholic beverages as well. If people aren't drinkers, we have, um, we have craft beer, hard cider, hard seltzer, um, wine, and we have panini and snacks, and you can bring in outside food too. So that's all at Blue Skies. Oh, that's great. Where can people find out more information? Uh, more information at blueskiesauburn.com or mbtbtasting.com, and we're also on uh, Facebook constantly. That's me. If you if you if you message on there, <laughs> you're talking to me. Um, so yeah, we have uh, different Facebook pages for each of the locations, but we we post constantly about all of our virtual events coming up as well as our in-person events too. Well, fingers crossed that uh, we don't go back another time, yeah. right? Like we continue to go forward because uh, I think we're all ready, especially if we go into the spring and it gets warmer out as well. We're going to see more and more people go out. And with that, though, I have to ask um, those bubbles. Do you think you're going to yeah. keep them around in the summertime? I think we'll probably keep them until um, it, the weather breaks, and then we're going to be able to put our patio back up in Auburn Hills um, at both Blue Skies and MBTB Auburn Hills. So then we will be able to do our, oh, and the MBTB Shelby too, we have a couple tables outside. So then we'll probably go back to our traditional outside seating for that point. But I'm not uh, ruling out putting the bubbles back up next year because people really, really enjoyed them. So they've been fun. I know. I want one for my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> My husband has one for the garage, so he can smoke his huh? cigars in the garage. Oh. <laughs> See? Well, Courtney, it's always great having you with us. We uh, so appreciate your time. But again, everyone, support Loco. And when you go to the restaurants, please be nice. Be kind. It's great Thank having you, you so with much, us. Thank you so much, Ronnie and Tyler. I appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. And when we come back, Mr. Bowtie will be with us. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan. We're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Park's COVID-19 help hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Great to have you back with us here on the Megacast. Just about 20 minutes left here in the show. Our last guest of the day, Dr. Todd Jenkins Jr., otherwise known as Dr. Bowtie, joins us now on the Megacast. So great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning to you both. How old were you when you learned how to tie your own bow tie? Because I'm guessing that's not a clip on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not a clip on. Um, I, it was it was in my actually it was in my collegiate days. Oh, that's great. Well, they look great. Um, before we kind of jump in 
to uh, the bow tie and the symbolism behind the bow tie. Tell us more about bow tie leadership and development, your company. Yeah, so yeah, Bowtie Leadership and Development, we're a global leadership um, and development firm. And, you know, we were started out of a passion um, around really helping improve people's lives on and off the clock. Um, and we started with leadership and now we are very fortunate um, to have a, a growing team and to be globally in five different countries. Uh, in addition, you know, our specialization today is focusing on inclusive um, efforts and uh, workplaces, nonprofits, um, and then also in the startup community. And so we enjoy doing this work every day um, and living our passion. We have an awesome team. And so I'm fortunate uh, to wake up to do this every day. So has it been hard for you during the pandemic to be able to teach your leadership program to uh, companies, but or is it easier because you can do it over the internet? Ah, interesting. Well, you know, I think it's the it, it, that's subjective. What? How do you define hard? And you know, what's subjective for easy? Um, I think it was, it's definitely been manageable. Um, just as such of other firms, and um, you know, when the pandemic happened, I was actually you know on on stage before the COVID hit, and the next thing we knew, we had to shift. Uh, into this virtual environment. And, you know, it was some concerns with our team, uh, with our contracts and things, because we have done so much in person. Uh, but, you know, as over the last five years, since we went global, a lot of our things are virtually. So it was just really a pivot and adjustment, just like we talk to our leaders about every day. Uh, so I think things were, it was manageable and it actually um, did better than we thought. Uh, by being able to virtually connect um, with, you know, due to the shift in the climate. And now we're able to, you know, save time, right, with the virtual connection, with our training, our programs. And we have actually received that it's just as effective as we were there in person. So, you know, this is actually a new normal of, a, of the hybrid, you know, that we're continuing to explore with our curriculum. So do you think that will continue post-pandemic? Oh, yeah, you know, um, I think, once again, I think it will be blended approach. Um, I think it's what's best for the client and the, the culture that we're working with, uh, but we're open and we're flexible. And I, I really do blend, I do, I'm sorry, I do believe that, you know, post the pandemic, we are in the new normal, right? We're adjusting to the new normal. So I don't think it's gonna be, uh, you know, an and or or, or but I think it's just really saying what, you know, what, what is best at the time for your people. So. so these are challenging times for so many business leaders. How have you had to shift what you teach to them and how they lead their team virtually? Yeah, you know, um, our, our curriculum talks about, re, you know, building resilience in the workplace, building, being flexible leaders, right? Being empathetic um, leaders. Um, and I think we were, you know, at a plan fill that all can recognize due to the pandemic being global, right? We can all recognize how it is impacting our families, um, our company, our communities, and some disproportionately is impacted differently, you know, based on um, identity status, et cetera. And so what we have really taught our leaders at the beginning of the pandemic is that, you know, stay true to your mission around equity and inclusion because your people need you, you know, more than ever before. And so as we continue to talk to leaders through this pandemic, it has never changed and it's not changing. Your people still need you. You still need to be people centered. Um, and so we're continuing to evolve leadership competencies around a people centered model that reflects your business solutions. Dr. Todd C. Jenkins with us here on the Megacast, otherwise known as Dr. Bowtie with Bowtie Leadership and Development. I have to say, though, I miss people, even the ones I didn't really like working with. Like, <laughs> it's just those organic, spur of the moment conversations. And while, yes, we can do our jobs remotely, that is the part that is missing. Yeah, you know, my response to that, of course, I miss people. Now, let me be very clear. I did not, you know, I do not uh, recommend that, you know, this is the entire lifestyle of how we should run our ecosystem and our social cues. You know, um, as a sociology background, I understand um, the, the characteristics and customs of being together in a unit 
to define your culture of your business, to actually help with productivity, um, and just overall um, health, if you will, um, holistic health. And so I miss people too. Um, and I do think, you know, as the turn and how, you know, how things are slowly coming back, um, we will be in a position again. I really do believe that we will be uh, back connected, you know, socially. However, you got, I, I want people to understand that people are going to come back into the social space at different levels of engagement. And so we need to be a little more um, empathetic and show grace and compassion of asking people, how do you wish to be treated? <laughs> Instead of assuming to say, this is how I'm going to treat you. So I'm going to throw in and hug you, high five you because I need that. And I miss that. And I think that is going to be an interesting piece that we need to talk a little bit more about in company culture, uh, really understanding, you know, boundaries and what's the expectations around interacting back together in the workplace. Yeah, we even have that within our own families. There's different <laughs> levels of comfort and how to address that within our own families. And now to go back into the workplace, you know, we need to have those conversations. So how are you teaching, uh, you know, your clients about what they can expect as more and more people head back into the offices? Yeah, you know, um, as to your point, you know, various comfort levels, we, this pandemic has definitely impacted us in so many different ways and uh, good and bad, right? It was some challenging parts and there was some opportunities. Um, and we dealt with two pandemics, you know, that was kind of emerged together. You got the pandemic of COVID-19 that the world recognized and the second pandemic racism that, you know, we were wakening back up to again, like it was a new thing. So those, those are a part of the conversation of coming back together from a company mission, vision, um, and values. And so what I'm telling leaders so how to prepare for, you know, return to work, because we've actually been doing this actually conversations over the last six months of uh, returning to work and phase and uh, phase plans, et cetera, is number one, what is your mission? What is your values? Because your values will set you free. And if you value your employees, you value your people, you're gonna do what you need to do to meet your people where they're at. Not assume where they need to be and where they should be. No, you need to talk to your people. Um, and that takes a lot more time, effort, and energy. And the best leaders um, are leading their people and not managers or managing things. So I think that's what we're continuing to um, encourage our leaders um, to have those conversations, create the spaces, um, create the parameters so your employees feel that they can be their best self as they, as they return back to work. So I know one of your areas of expertise deals with uh, diversity and uh, equity and inclusion in the workplace. As we start to head back and you're merging those conversations about racism, um, but also a pandemic on top of that, how important is it for some of these companies? Because we do see so many companies will put out statements, but it's they're not actually living the words. So how can they take it from a statement on a piece of paper to actually living it within the culture of that workplace? Yeah, you know, it depends, you know, everything depends on the culture. And, you know, since we have global climates, definitely different things around laws, et cetera. But I'm going to keep it very general. You just said it. It's a statement. It's something that comes out of your mouth, right? So how can you follow that up with your behavior? So the things you think, say, and do. Um, and I think that comes down to what we call strategy development. Your diversity, equity, and inclusion doesn't just happen. Maybe the diversity, when you get diverse identities in a room together, you know, but inclusive climate, that is facilitated. And equity is inspired design. And so in order to actually live out this statement, you need to be able to have your strategy in place. And this is a journey. It's a journey of maturity. And everyone starts on this journey very differently. And so you have to be able to um, ensure that you have those actionable, have the correct infrastructure of sustainability and accountability. Um, education is important. Of course, that is one of the key, but you have to be able to bake diversity, equity, and inclusion into your system. Um, in order for it to sustain. And so it, we are for, and we take an um, a ecosystem approach, um, not only just your system with internal, the workplace, but also your marketplace, your, your customers, the communities in which you live and serve. And so once you examine 
and really diagnose the issue. Now you can um, treat, <laughs> treat the diagnose, if you will. And so that's what we need to continue to do to have our treatment plan, uh, plan for um, racism and then our prevention plans for all the other isms um, or et cetera that the company is probably engaging with on the society in which they are currently taking place. So give us the story behind the bow tie. <laughs> the bow tie. So for me, you know, I'm sure you uh, get to ask that quite often, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the bow tie for me, uh, you know, is larger than the necktie. Uh, it came to me. I love to travel locally and globally. Uh, and when I, you know, where whether I'm traveling from the shopping mark, I, I'm here in Bentonville, Arkansas, so home of Walmart. So whether I'm traveling to Walmart or I'm going to Germany and the airplane, like you know, going through. Uh, the terminal, people will stop and ask me about my bow tie and my necktie. I mean, curious, like people are like, hey, did you tie that yourself? Or people say like this nice things, like it looks cool, I like your bow, and it doesn't matter the company, uh, or I'm sorry, the culture or country. Um, and so I started to have this epiphany, um, this epiphany of what if we lived in a society where people would genuinely stop what they're doing to be curious about another human that they never met before. Just what if we lived in that society that we approach each other out of curiosity and compassion and positivity? And so the bow tie for me essentially is that platform of our philosophy, how I do business, how I live my life. Um, it's an acronym of how to have everyday conversations um, as such. Um, and, and then also in due part, you know, every day I wake up to, you know, create environments for people to belong and thrive together one bow tie combo at a time. So really, you know, this, this necktie has really became, you know, essentially how I live my day-to-day -day life and how I align my best yes and best no's. And I think that curiosity, that vulnerability um, can really take us into new levels of engagement around empathy. So with that, it's a conversation starter. Yes, uh, so how is that, do you think is going to, be, how do you think it's going to be impacted um, in the p middle of the pandemic as you start to travel again? People aren't so willing to come up and talk to strangers yes. now like right. they used to be. Yeah, you know, um, you, you're right, you know, and I, you know, just as the bow tie and the necktie is just a conversation starter, I do think it's going to be an interesting dynamic of, you know, of people with, like we were talking about earlier, the levels of comfort and as, as well as caution, right? Um, and it's, it's very interesting that every, you know, everyone is not um, so expressive to go and go have the courage to go speak to someone. And so that's not an expectation, but here's, here's the point around the bow tie combo. It doesn't really take place of just a conversation starter. It's really take place of being in the moment with someone else, whether that's a stranger or not, and being able to really maximize the conversation um, so you can lead the conversation better than you came in from an empathy level. And so it's really talk about how you can be engaged, be open to new ideas, willing to share your own experience. That's B-O-W. And the hardest part of the conversation is the just not in the middle, which is the T-I-E. How do you make that conversation better than you found it? So have you seen the mask where they light up and you can put messages on them <laughs> and they kind of scroll across yeah. your face? Yeah. I think you need a bow tie that does that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Hey, if you if you have a referral, uh, please feel free to send it to um, <laughs> myself or my team. We'll love that. You know, I, I think, you know, uh, going going forward, uh, we, we this interesting social climate that we're in, you know, um, it, it has allowed for us to pause for a moment. Um, so many times we're, we have excuses around technology are distracting us or my life, I got to go to work, I got to do this, I have to do that. And I think this pandemic really put us in a place to pause and reflect on the things that matter to you um, as a person or as a company or as a community. And I think moving forward, we're gonna take, I, I really do believe that the ones who have been able to reflect on those multiple levels are gonna take that back into the workplace. And I think we're gonna to continue to align uh, more of a value-centered model that's holistic. So the, I'm not just way at work, this is one bow tie tied. I'm not just way one in the community, I'm not just one way with my family. It's this harmony that I really think that we're evolving in as a society to have a blended approach as we do life. 
Yeah, I think we'll all be a little bit nicer to one another when we get back to where we once sure were, hope. right? Dr. Todd Jenkins with us here on the Megacast. He is known as Dr. Bowtie from Bowtie Leadership and Development. It's been great having you with us. Your smile is infectious. It is. <laughs> Do you ever have a bad day? <laughs> uh, you know, I... You know, I I don't really think I have bad days. You know, you I could have some moments. You know, I have some moments where I can Fair consider enough. it as a potentially challenge, challenging or disappointment. Uh, but no, I, I make sure I determine the difference between the moments and the situation. And my situations can linger to, through days. And I'm blessed to say that I don't have. Um, <laughs> I, I can't really write down the bad situations. I will say that. You know, I'm not sure if you all knew, uh, but I we just uh, welcome uh, a new arrival in my home, which is our yes. first newborn yes. son. Oh, congratulations! Uh, and, so, uh, and so I don't really think at this moment. Of course, this is a, as a new father, but you know, my legacy is here. I don't think I have uh, any bad days move going forward. Every day is going to be turned into something that's going to be better. So I'm just super stoked. I'm super excited. Well, we so appreciate your time. You can find out more at uh, bowtieleadership.com. This has been the Oakland County Megacast.